Welcome to Amici, news and insights from the New York courts. I'm John Carr. For today's Diversity Dialogue segment, we are honored and humbled to welcome to the program the Honorable Rowan D. Wilson, who was recently sworn in as the 39th person in state history to formally hold the title of Chief Judge and the first of color. Chief Judge Wilson, who took office as Chief Judge on April 19th, had served as an Associate Judge of the Court since 2017. A native of California, Judge Wilson has a bachelor's degree from Harvard College and a law degree from Harvard Law School. He clerked for a federal appellate court judge and spent most of his career practicing securities, intellectual property, and antitrust law with the Manhattan firm of Cravath, Swain, and Moore. His clients included IBM, Time Warner, and American Express. He was the first ever black partner at Cravath, a firm that dates to 1819. Much has been written about Judge Wilson's jurisprudence, and he's publicly revealed a bit of his administrative agenda. So rather than mirror what's already been done, I'd like to take this opportunity to look behind the curtain, beyond the robes, to get to know Judge Wilson on a more personal level. Chief Judge Wilson, it's an honor to have you on the program. Let's start at the beginning, if we could. Tell me, if you would, about your your parents. What did they do? How did they shape you? Sure. So my parents were both both educators. They met actually at uh, in the graduate education program at Boston University in the fifties. And my my dad was getting a master's degree, and my mom was getting a PhD. My mom uh, was totally blind, and they, they the story about how they met some people react sort of very charmingly and some people react like gee doesn't speak too well of your dad but I gather that he liked her but didn't you know maybe have a normal way of introducing himself so what he and he was also he's very much a practical joker so he got some kind of very huge rock or brick or something like that and surreptitiously put it into her book bag and so when class was over and she went to pick it up the thing was extraordinarily heavy and she burst into tears and then he introduced himself and apologized and they were married a couple of years later so he was a knight in shining armor who who, who solved yes. that problem of her having created his own distress <laughs> and then yes but they were um so more to your question how they shaped me because they were both well there were there were a bunch of factors i'm the oldest of three and because my mother was totally blind she needed somebody to you know, get her places, but also read basic things to her. So how do you know if something is a can of cream of mushroom soup versus a can of uh, you know tomato soup? Um, you need somebody to be able to read. So I learned how to read. I was bad at lots of things early on, but I was a really good reader very early on. And so I, you know, a lot of my childhood was really spent reading things to her, including so when, when they, she, they left BU when my dad got his master's, so she left also with a master's and something else that was called a certificate of advanced graduate specialization, which was essentially what we now call ABD, all but dissertation. And they moved, they didn't like the cold in Boston. They moved, I had an uncle in Florida. They went to Florida and hated Florida. They were only there for a week or two and then um, traded in their, their um, bus tickets for a car or something like that. I may have it backwards and went to California. And my dad was looking for work in California, and um, he almost ended up having to take a job at a car wash. I mean, this is a guy with a master's in education in you know, 1959. But at the very last minute, a um, one-year teaching position at in a little town called Paris, P-E-R-R-I-S, which is in the desert somewhere. I've never been opened up. And so he took that job for a year. My parents lived there for a year. And then he got a job working for the state of California at what we would, what would we now call it. It was then called the um, Pacific State Hospital. It was essentially a state-run institution for intellectually challenged people. Uh, and so he, he worked there. We lived in Pomona. I was born in Pomona, um, which is a suburb outside of Los Angeles, about 30 miles or so. And lots of my childhood was shaped by taking my mom places, reading things to her. When we moved to Berkeley when I was seven, and she... Um, uh, started a PhD program there. I read a bunch of her coursework to her. Uh, she finished that when I was um, just about to turn 12. And she didn't start it again. And two, so I have two younger siblings. So she um, was not employed outside of the home until I think the 1968-69 school year when she taught special education at Castro Valley High School. 
And then she went back and got her doctorate uh, from UC Berkeley in 72. You must have learned, a, you obviously learned a great deal about people who are sightless and how they how, how they navigate the world. I did. Uh, and also, and, and it was interesting because she could do many things that you, well, so there were, obviously we had to make accommodations. So kids couldn't leave toys and tripping hazards all over the floor. So our house was not like that. But she would, you know, ask me whether a, a bill was a $1 bill or a $5 bill or a $10 bill and would fold the bills differently when she put them in her wallet. So she wouldn't then need me or somebody else to be able to know what kind of bill it was. If you took three or four or even up to like five different coins and dropped them on a hard surface, she could pretty unfailingly tell you what they were. So really? I can't do that. You probably can't do that. But Absolutely not. some of your other senses are accentuated because you need to rely on them when you've lost a sense. Um, so it was interesting. It, as it, when my father, when, well, when we moved to Berkeley in 1968, um, which is interesting for many reasons, quite apart from my family, my dad uh, was still working with the state, but he transferred and was teaching at the um, California State School for the Blind which blind and deaf actually, which was then located in Berkeley. So he could you know, walk to and from um, his job. So I have, have a lot growing up, a lot of people who were you know, uh, challenged uh, in terms of you know, differently abled. So you, you were born in 1960. Uh, yep. By that time, Brown v. Board was settled, if not universally accepted law. The civil rights era was really gained steam when you were a kid. But in your parents' generation, they, they came of age in the Jim Crow era and were full-grown adults when the Civil Rights Act was passed, when the March on Washington occurred, when Martin Luther King was assassinated. What did you learn from them about what they had experienced in their life? So they were very, I would say, socially conscious. And, you know, when when they received their degrees from BU, um, Dr. King was back there to receive his honorary degree, and so he spoke, you know, during their commencement, and he actually spoke with my mom. You know, people would, she has a lot of, had, I guess she passed away when I was 18, but she has a lot of, had a lot of stories about meeting people and, and various, she was also just a very good storyteller, but another person she met sitting on a bench one day was Ernest Hemingway. Wow. Uh, so anyway, but back to, back to civil rights, um, I don't remember President Kennedy's assassination, but I remember my parents certainly talking about it. I was old enough to have, have watched TV and be with my parents when um, they were watching the coverage of, of Dr. King being assassinated. I, I, you know, watched the I Have a Dream speech. It was televised. And, I, you know, I remember it. I don't I couldn't have obviously recited it to you. But I, you know, partly because I was reading all sorts of things to my mom, I, I was pretty aware. And then once we moved to Berkeley, you know, the whole you know, the free speech movement, the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement. Were, it, Berkeley was a very interesting, unusual place in the 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, you know, I, I watched the um, 1968 Democratic and Republican conventions. I watched the Watergate hearings. And this is all as a kid. And, you know, they they were really, you know, very influential in being sort of critical. I don't mean critical in, in terms of, you know, I, I'm th using it in the sort of critical thinking sense of sort of st standard doctrine about things. So that when, one of the things that they would turn on after they would watch the national news, always Walter Cronkite. But then there was also the local um, PBS station in Berkeley, K KQED, that had a very kind of counterculture news um, feed that took a different angle on things and, and you know, was very in tune to a lot of um, civil rights uh, sorts of issues. So were you, were you reading newspapers to your, to your mom? So I was reading some some newspapers. There were magazines that she could get in Braille, and so I didn't have to read those. The daily newspapers typically didn't come in Braille, and this is way before you can get an audio anything. You know, books, whether they were fiction or nonfiction, she could largely get in Braille. It not Typically not her, her academic PhD coursework. It had to be sort of mass media things. One of the um, things that I always thought was hysterical. And so, she, you know, she there was a, there were two ways that she got reading material. One was through a place called Recording for the Blind, and they would come in big reel-to-reel -reel tapes, and so she could listen, which was not her preferred way of reading. She would also get books in Braille. I've forgotten the service they came from, but they came in these very large, rigid, almost squarish size containers, probably 22, 24 inches square, 
because the braille took a lot of space and when the raised dots made the pages a lot thicker than they would otherwise be and they were pretty heavy paper to begin with so the braille would hold up and so you might get you know a 300 page book and it would come in four of these kind of crates but and magazines could come that way too and one of the magazines that she got which i thought was hysterical was playboy <laughs> and of course you're not getting any pictures or anything like that but it did always have interviews with uh, people and she was reading it for the interviews she got lots of other you know national geographic and other sort of mass media um, publications that way she was an avid reader she hardly slept and i guess one great thing about being blind is you could read next to your spouse in the middle of the night and you wouldn't need a light i guess not so you know if you walked by their bedroom really late at night or really in the morning you'd hear the sound of turning pages what were your most formative experiences as a child well, I think, you know, we went through some of them, really. It was sort of, you know, recognizing that I could really help. And, you know, because I was the oldest, uh, that, that um, and that you get a great enjoyment out of helping people. So that, you know, having having been brought up in a circumstance where that was my job, really, it, it, things like that kind of came natural to me. I think it, it was also, um, you know, growing up in Berkeley, I think, was also formative. I think if we'd stayed in Pomona, which was a very sleepy place, you know, not really much happening there. I don't, I, you know, don't know that I would have um, involved myself in the things I've involved myself in. So is that early lesson that uh, in the enjoyment of helping people, what led you to the law? I think it ultimately did. I mean, it was that and a couple of other things. I, I realized very early on that I couldn't draw at all. So architecture was out. And then I, I was interested in medicine until a very well-meaning teacher when I was 11 years old took me on a weekend to the human anatomy lab, UCSF Medical School. And uh, the students were um, cutting open human cadavers. And uh, that, that was the end of medicine for me. <laughs> Wait, when did you decide you wanted to be a lawyer? Well, that's a difficult question. I decided that I wanted to be involved in sort of government or public service or issues like that, I would say around ninth, 10th grade. I didn't know any lawyers. Uh, I hadn't met any lawyers. Um, I'm sure I knew that they existed. And when I went to college, and so it's probably even a little bit before that, I thought that whatever it was I wanted to do in the field of, of you know, public policy or, or government, it would be good to have a law degree, which isn't the same thing as being a lawyer. I was really not sure, even when I was in law school, that I wanted to be a lawyer. But and what I thought that I wanted to do as I was sort of finishing up law school was to be a law professor. But one of the things that I had noticed about the, the professors that I had as sort of as a generalization is that the ones who had also done something practical with the law, either that they actually had worked as lawyers for a while or that while they were professors, they took cases on the side, even if it was just an appeal here and an appeal there or they worked with a clinic that having that real world, world experience made them, at least to me, a better professors. And so the, the, with that objective in mind and then having clerked or, or while I was clerking, sort of thinking that I should go somewhere and get a few years of experience and also pay down some student loans and, um, and then look for teaching jobs was still what I was thinking about, you know, as I, even as I ended my clerkship two years out of law school. And how did you end up in uh, corporate law? Well, that's a good question. So it was it was litigation. It wasn't um, putting together deals and that sort of thing. So it was, um, you know, it was the area of law that I that I thought I would be interested in. Until I had a, a job at a law firm my first year, I didn't realize there were lawyers who never went to court. I mean, that's how little contact I, I had with the law. Um, I did have a an undergraduate course in constitutional law with Archibald Cox, but that was obviously coming at, at things from a very public policy and litigation kind of perspective. So, and, and from my, all of my experience in high school and speech and debate and, and um, you know, Cal YMCA Youth and Government and Model UN and things like that, my, I would never have gone and been someone who, who negotiated and drafted transactional documents. I, I always would have, you know, wound up on the litigation side of things. And so I wound up at, at Cravath because it had the reputation of being the best firm in the country a firm that would give you the most experience the fastest and you know remembering that my objective was to get a you know two three maybe four years of experience 
and then go off and get a teaching job. And then I figured that even though I wasn't from New York and I really didn't have any intention of staying in New York, that you know, if you were able to get a teaching job anywhere, it, you'd be lucky, and it might be anywhere in the country. So that you know, being in New York for a couple of years wasn't really going to affect my chances of getting a teaching job somewhere, and it wasn't going to set down permanent roots in New York or anything like that. So I was really looking at Cravath just for the experience I could get. And while you were doing that, I know you spent something like 20 years fighting employment discrimination in, in that Alabama case involving black and female plaintiffs. Yeah, and I started in 1989 the, on that, and I finished in 2017. So it was 28 years, if I count 20, right. Is that right? I think so. Yeah. And then you're also involved in the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under the law, and Neighborhood Defender Services. Why did you get involved in those activities? Different reasons for different ones. So the... the um, the Alabama case was really one where I was assigned when I was a relatively senior associate. I was assigned to a partner who'd taken that case on in 1983. And when I became a partner, he essentially turned the case over to me. He'd, he'd had kind of enough of it. He took it up to the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court. He lost on a 5-4 decision on a, um, a collateral estoppel issue. And so then the whole thing had to go back for retrial and there were lots of twists and turns. But really, that was one where, you know, I was assigned to it just as I might have been assigned to any work. And then he when I was a partner, he turned it over to me and then it was my responsibility to finish it out, uh, which took, you know, I think he turned it over to me fully, I'd say, probably in 1994, 1995. And, um, you know, I had it the same way I would have had any other piece of work in the office. So that was an extracurricular work really. Um, but but you did do a lot of extracurricular work as well. Yes, I did. I mean, Lawyers Committee for um, for Civil Rights was, um, you know, a, a different partner who had been on the board asked me to be on the on the board, and I agreed. Um, it seemed like an organization that did a lot of good work. The firm had a long history of it. Um, the um, So there's only been one other Cravath partner to serve on the Court of Appeals, and he served for um, a total of nine months back in the 1940s. His name was Bruce Bromley. He was a, a titan of the bar. And um, but back then, Court of Appeals judges um, had to stand for election. That's how you got on the court. There wasn't the commission. He was appointed by Governor Dewey to fill out the stub term of Thomas Thatcher, who was the Thatcher from Simpson, Simpson Thatcher, who'd gotten sick. And uh, and he failed in his reelection bid. There's an interesting story behind that that I won't. I mean, if you want to know, I can tell you. But but um, he then was sort of the person who founded the litigation department at Cravath. And in 1965, I want to say, I could have the year wrong, when President Kennedy called together a whole bunch of leaders of the commercial bar from around the country to the White House, and there were 200 and something lawyer heads of law firms who came, to form the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, Bruce Bromley was one of the people there. So he was there at the founding, and Cravath has had a long relationship with the Lawyers Committee. Uh, it couldn't have been 65. Kennedy was dead by 60, then. So it must be 63 I'm thinking of. Yeah, that's why I was hesitating about 65. 63 is probably – it was July, I know. Oh, just before he got assassinated. Yeah, just before he got it – was, it, was it was the same summer – it's 63. It was the same summer as the March on Washington. Now, for someone who uh, did not plan on spending – very much time in New York and didn't especially want to be here. It seemed like you wanted very much to be on the Court of Appeals because by my count, you were on at least six lists before before the uh, you finally got that call. Why were you so interested in serving in the Court of Appeals as opposed to anywhere else? Well, I was interested. I was interested in the Court of Appeals. I was I was I think I would say I would I was most interested in being a judge and I was most interested in being an appellate judge. I think there are kind of fundamental, and I don't want to insult anybody, but it's sort of fundamental differences between being a, an appellate judge and a trial judge. For me, I really enjoy working with other people and bouncing ideas off of them and finding out that some great idea I had is wrong for reasons I didn't anticipate. That's, to me, a really great intellectual exercise. And I like having the time that appellate judges do to think through things. And I think um, trial judges don't really don't have those um, luxuries and and they enjoy something different. They enjoy seeing the litigants, managing the, a trial, which sort of has a life of its own, making 
quick decisions that they have to about you know, rulings on evidence and other things like that. And, you know, between the two, I think I'm better suited to the, the appellate um, job. So there are great things about being a federal appellate judge. Principally, you've got great surroundings and great help and life tenure. So I've got great surroundings and great help and a 14-year term and I age out at age 70. So the latter is a drawback, assuming that by age 70, I still would want to work, which who knows, um, or even be able to work. But but the work of the, you know, because the Court of Appeals, unlike the federal courts, is a common law court, it, it, that's a huge plus as far as I'm concerned, because there's, the federal courts aren't. And we have a body of law that we work with to try and adapt it to um, changes in society and and. Uh, Changes in technology, changes in the way we live, changes in, in statutes. And that's, you know, it's a very, it's a, it's a great kind of public policy element that the federal courts, other than perhaps the Supreme Court, which will say it's not, you know, involved in um, policy making and is just following the law and isn't a common law court. But, you know, yeah, that's um, up for debate, let's say. <laughs> I suppose it is. Now, substantive, substantively, the federal and state constitutions are, are entirely different creatures. They are. And New York's is, well, I, I, I would say I could, you could use some editing, but it's uh, much, much more extensive, much more expansive, and much more, I would think, suitable for creativity. I think it is. And it's, um, and it, there's a kind of, I think, advantage that the Court of Appeals has uh, with regard to the New York Constitution that the Supreme Court doesn't have or maybe shouldn't have with regard to the federal Constitution, which is you can amend the New York Constitution. It's been amended 250 times um, in, in less time than the U.S. Constitution has existed. And the 250 is, is a conservative count because sometimes it was amended by conventions. And then how you count, you know, 67 different amendments that happened at a convention, you count them as one, you count them as 67, do you count them as 23 because a lot of them are interrelated? It, you know, that's a that's a pretty conservative number and the people can can modify it directly by popular vote after the legislature, you know, successively passes the amendment. And so the, the way that affects the Court of Appeals is we can, we don't have to worry so much about making a mistake. I mean, of course you worry about making a mistake. Of course you try to get the, the law right. But if we misinterpret the Constitution, particularly if we misinterpret it badly, something can be done about that with much greater ease than amending the United States Constitution. And that, you know, that's comforting. Are there judges historically of the Court of Appeals or any court who you particularly admire or consider judicial role models? Hmm. Well, certainly from the from the Court of Appeals, and these are going to be a little bit trite answers, I'm afraid, uh, you know, I keep judge cardozo's writings where i can reach them just by turning around and grabbing well you're, them. you're sitting at his desk aren't you i am now yes i am now which is um i'm careful not to have any liquids anywhere near it <laughs> and you know uh sort of my new hat on you know judge k i think was very well respected was um open and administratively i think ran the courts beautifully uh it, it's a that's a tough act to follow but um, in, in terms of, you know, how something I would like to aspire towards and don't get it, I think the way that she managed things was really, really wonderful. Uh, in terms of writing on the U.S. Supreme Court, Justice Jackson, never going to be able to write that well, but uh, he, you know, wrote absolutely beautifully. I think um, Justice Stevens, in terms of kind of creativity and uh, looking at things from a different vantage point that, that many others did, um, was it, was it was always fun to read his separate opinions. Those are the ones I'd pick out immediately. Now, the Court of Appeals didn't have its first black judge appointed to a full term until 1985, when you were 25 years old. Yeah. And that was uh, Judge Fritz Alexander, who was appointed by Governor Mary Cuomo. As of today, there are, I think se- there have been seven black judges on the court, two right now, you and Just- Judge Troutman. What can we say about the progress that's been made during your lifetime? You know, my lifetime now spans back, as you, you mentioned earlier, to, um, you know, just a little after Brown and well before the Civil Rights Act, well before Loving Virginia, well before a lot of other, you know, cases that, and when I went to, you know, when I went to college, 
uh, in Boston in the, you know, 1977, I showed up there. This, you know, this was almost in the teeth of the um, anti-busing demonstrations. It was not, you know, it would, it, I wouldn't say that even in Boston, which you think of as a pretty liberal place, Brown and cases like that were really fully accepted. I mean, they've been accepted, they may have been accepted by the legal establishment, but by the people who lived in South Boston, you know, there were plenty of places I would not go back then. And I, that's changed in my lifetime. I mean, that's changed since I was uh, college age. We, we had a school group visit the Court of Appeals. Um, we weren't in session then, but I went up. It was, uh, there were a bunch of kids from Westchester and then some from Nyack, middle schoolers and high schoolers. And uh, one of the teachers from the middle school group said to the students, who were sitting, you know, in the, in the gallery in the courtroom where, where the audience would sit, you know, look at the, because the courtroom is lined with portraits. Look, look ahead of you, look at the sides, look at those portraits, and now turn around and look at the ones behind you. And do you notice any difference? And the kid immediately shot his hand up and said, yeah, there are people who look like me on the back. And if you want to find women or African-Americans or Latinx people, they're on the back of the courtroom. But and that's where the more recent ones go. That's that's you know Judge K is up back there too, but that tells you something about the progress. It, you know about how how long a period of time there was none, and then how more recently there's been at least in comparison, you know immeasurably different progress. Another group came in that was called uh, this is when we were in session called uh, Girls Rule the Girls Rule the Law. And I you know I was sitting as chief then and I welcomed them and I said and if you look up here at the bench you'll see that women rule the court because four of the judges sitting are women. Now you preside over what is certainly the most diverse court of appeals in state history. Two black judges, two Latinx judges, one openly gay judge, the first Greek ever to serve on the court, and as you just mentioned, women hold a majority. Why does diversity matter on the high court? Well, diversity matters because we're trying to arrive at the best sort of communal decision we can. And it isn't, it's, it's a diversity of all kinds of experiences. It's not just a diversity of what's your ethnic background. But, you know, for example, Judge Singus brings a lot to the court because she was a prosecutor. She was the district attorney for Nassau. And so in particularly in criminal matters, she has a perspective that, you know, I don't have, I was never a prosecutor, nor was I a defense attorney. So I, you know, it, I can learn a lot from her observations about how things really work. Likewise, you know, in a, in a complicated, you know, reverse mortgage backed securities matter, I've got some experience with those. And, um, you know, Judge Singus doesn't and uh, Judge Rivera doesn't. And so it's it, it it isn't just, you know, it's all I mean, people's upbringings also matter also, of course. Uh, and there you, you were asking about things about my family that shaped me. Those certainly give you influence your perspective on how you um, relate to people and how you relate to ideas and, and how you relate to the law. And it's good to have those different perspectives you know, in terms of not just professional experience, but also upbringing, because they, you then, as long as you're all good listeners and have some flexibility, I think you, you and this goes back to, you know, why would I rather be an appellate judge than a, than a trial judge? A trial judge, you, don't, you know, I rule whatever I rule and somebody reverses me or they don't, and maybe I care about that or maybe I don't, but it's all on me and there's nothing wrong with that, but um, I much rather work collaboratively, collaboratively with people and it's great, you know, it, when they have a different perspective and different things to bring to the discussion. If well, historically, I mean, not always, but I think for the vast majority of its history, the Court of Appeals was a collaborate co collegial court. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Now, as you well know, the court system received a not exactly stellar report card from Secretary Jay Johnson a, a few years ago, following a very thorough look at the court system and its efforts to eradicate bias. What can you do to make sure our next report card shows some improvement? Well, I think the the most important thing is to set the right tone and to emphasize that, you know, we need to value each other for who we are and that that obstacles to advancement are shouldn't be there if they're you know based on race or ethnicity or um you know, anything that we, we don't think really matters in terms of who you are and what kind of a job you can do. And then I think it's important to, to look for um, qualified people, even those who aren't in the system, and to try and get them into the system. So, and, and you know, from, from many years of, of um, recruiting um, from Cravath, I learned that 
kind of mass communications directed at target populations don't really work very well. So, for example, we're, was the, we're the court system now to send out, we're short of court officers, and it would be nice to have a more diverse group of court officers. I mean, that's one of the things that the Johnson report says, right? And, but if we were to publish something either on the website or elsewhere saying we really are looking for officers from diverse populations, my experience is that's going to produce nothing. It's not going to make it any difference. And even if my picture is plastered on the thing, it's not going to make any difference. So what people have to do is to go to high schools and try to tell people about that. And so we're doing that. For the first time, we have um, a program where we're going to pay high school students or recent graduates. There's 100 spots. We're, we'll expand it next year if um, we need. Um, $18 an hour to work for the summer. And we're going to put them in, in different places within the court system, clerk's offices, you know, to expose them to things and to actually pay them to do some work while they're there it, with the idea of encouraging them to think about a career in the court system. People throughout the system have to be committed to try and taking these young people, exposing them to the system, treating them well, and encouraging them to, to think about a career with the courts. As you may or may not know, for the past several months, there's been a, a recruitment video in the works, which is almost done. And part of the intention, part of the aim there is to show high school students the range of careers that we have. I mean, what, what, what do they think of the courts? They've got a bunch of lawyers and judges, and they probably have no idea of the potential to be a, a law enforcement officer, an IT specialist, a social worker, and et cetera. Yep. So I went to the Kings County Law Day uh, event and um, uh, Judge Quinones had a bunch of students in whom she'd been working with through their mock trial program. And, um, you know, it's that. So, you know, when the video is done, the great thing would be not simply to send it off to a high school to be shown there, but to have somebody who works for the courts go and talk to the students and meet them in person. And, you know, there might it might be a group of 30 of them and there might be only one or two who stay after to ask a question or who look you know, during the thing like they're not falling asleep, but they're actually paying attention, and then you can go say, you know, what did you think about this? And, you know, uh, is there anything that, that you saw was interesting? And, you know, we have summer jobs for next summer. It's that, what I found is that it's that one-on-one -on -one contact that produces results. And it's laborious. Yep. Um, there's, you know, a, a lot of overhead associated with it, but it pays dividends. Now, you, of course, have two huge jobs, chief judge of the highest court in the state and chief judge of perhaps the most complex court system in the nation. What are your biggest challenges as a jurist and as an administrator? Well, as a jurist, it's the same as it's been for the last six and a half years, which is just try to get the law right. And I don't, you know, on the on the jurisprudential side of things, I don't think my job has changed very much. I mean, there are administrative things related to the Court of Appeals. So I would like to take more cases and, you know, I have some ability to influence that. I'd like to have fewer things on the non-argument track. So I have some ability to influence that. So th there are, you know, certain types of things there where, although they're kind of administrative, they really have to do with the Court of Appeals, where they will affect the jurisprudence of the court. But in terms of, you know, getting my colleagues to see things my way and, and to, or me to see it their way, but, to, you know, to come to some kind of consensus, I don't really think of my job as chief as very much different than it was before. I mean, I think we all should be striving to agree where we can, and then if not, to you know carefully uh, articulate uh, the, why we think something different should be the result. On the administrative side, I think is where I've got the huge challenge, not simply because I haven't been a court administrator before or, or been in the system, but because you know, Judge Marks retired towards the end of last year, so we lost all that institutional capacity. We've we have to fill that spot, which we just did with um, Justice Zayas, who I think will be great. Um, but he's also, you know, he wasn't a deputy chief administrative judge before that, so he's also got uh, a learning curve, maybe not as steep as mine, but pretty steep. The head counsel job at the Office of Court Administration is vacant. We've got to fill that. Um, that's also a place where you have a bunch of institutional knowledge and especially dealing with the legislature on varieties of things we want to do that's you know vacant and then there are you know spots on my own staff that well spots that i didn't have that i now have that are also vacant that i've got to fill and then there's you know that my task of getting to know the administrative judges around the state and visiting courts around the state and and you know along with justice Ias and the deputy chief administrative judges 
learning what the needs are and then working with the judges and the you know court administrators and the legislature and the governor's staff to try and come up with solutions where we need them but you know my, i don't i'm oversimplifying this a bit <clears throat> but many of the um, committees and commissions that exist have looked at the court system from kind of a, a top-down way and tried to come up with policies to address a problem where the problem may exist everywhere or may exist almost everywhere, but exists in different forms and to different degrees. And so the a, a kind of top-down solution may work to some degree, but I, I think that, you know, Judge Elias and I think that we're better off working from the bottom up and finding out place by place, you know, what's working well, what isn't working, why isn't it working, what is it you think you need to make it work better, and tailoring the solutions on a more local uh, basis. So that's that's a hard task. It uh, is. In, in many ways, it's a tale of well, not two states, but 62 of them. Yeah. I mean, you know, life in Lewis County is considerably different than it is in Brooklyn. Yeah, and even Brooklyn and the Bronx are different. And, um, you know, I, I was um, probably, I don't know, eight months ago or so, I spent a day um, in um, drug treatment court in the Bronx. And the the resource available there to find um, placements for people is vastly different than it is in Manhattan and even different than it is in Staten Island. And they need different things, but, you know, it, it's that kind of investigation that I think can produce the best allocation of resources. Now, on, on the caseload, the only way to increase that really is to grant leave more often. Yes, although we're not the only ones who can grant leave. Right. And hist historically, I think uh, Court of Appeals chief judges have not necessarily looked kindly on appellate division judges who voice cases on them. It sounds like you're taking a different uh, approach. Yeah. So, and here's my spiel about that. And let's think about, let's think about the civil cases. Because that's where, I mean, there's been a fall off in both, but I think last year for the first time we had, at least as far back as I've looked, which is at least a decade, we had more criminal cases than civil, which is really unusual. The, the balance ought to be something like, not quite two to one, but, you know, 60, 40, something in there. And so the drop off on the civil cases has been much sharper than on the, on the criminal cases. So then think about what the process is for the, for the civil cases. If we're going to grant leave, what happens is somebody applies for leave. It goes to our central staff and our central staff has their supervisors, but basically it's 12 attorneys who are quite young, not necessarily straight out of law school, though some are, and they're there for a two-year stint and then they move on. So there's six who start new every year and six who've been there for a year. So they get that, they get the they leave application, they get the underlying papers, they prepare a report and recommendation. They're usually quite thorough. They're good at picking up procedural issues and so on, and those come to us. And at least in my time on the court, I would estimate, I haven't counted, that probably 98% of those recommend denying leave. And I, I and my law clerks have spent a lot of time over the past many years writing memos, uh, several each month, saying, no, 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 we should grant leave. Now, my batting average on that is something like 40%, which is a good batting average, but a bad free throw percentage. And, but that means that they're, you know, and I've calculated at one point, something like a quarter to a third of the civil cases in which we get granted leave are ones in which central staff had said no, and my clerks and I wrote a memo saying yes, and I was able to get a second vote. So several for several years, the um, number of civil cases granted, oh, sorry, let me, let me skip to that in a second. But if you're thinking about the appellate division, when they're sending us a case, there's been four or five judges, depending on whether they're in the second department or elsewhere, who've been through the case. They've decided the case, they've read the record, they've read the papers, and now they've read the leave application. My basic point is, I think they're in a better position than our central staff to identify cases that we should hear. I'm not sure they're in a better position than the judges of the Court of Appeals, except that they are privy to things we don't know. So to give you an example, several years ago, I was having um, lunch with um, Judge Acosta, and he said to me in kind of a little bit of frustration that he sent a case to us that had, there were 14 other cases that had the same issue that they were holding up for our decision in the case that he sent. And we decided it on a different ground that didn't help with the other 14 cases. And I said, well, we have no way to know that you've got these other 14 cases. And I also said to him, if you look back, you know, 75, 100 years, the appellate division didn't 
certify cases saying, was the order of the appellate division correctly made? They certified an actual question of law the way that the Second Circuit or other federal appeals courts do. Yeah, so so almost if you, a certified question. Exactly. And then you can find case, lots and lots of cases like that from 100 years ago. That's what the that's what the appellate division did. So in a circumstance like that, either, you know, somebody could communicate to the court. We've got a bunch of other cases on this issue, and that's why we're sending or they could simply certify that particular question. So for a lot of reasons, I think that they are actually in a good position to send us cases. And, you know, the, if they send us a case that, that we think is trivial or we really shouldn't have, we can put it on the non-argument track. It doesn't take too much to dispose of it then. And if there are a lot of cases like that coming from some particular judge or some particular court, you know, I can then have a conversation with the, the PJ or with that judge and, or both and say, you know, this is recurring and, um, you know, here's something that, you know, here's why we really don't think this is worth our time, rather than sort of just saying, don't send us anything, which I, I think is a mistake. So, th so yes, we can, we can grant more. And I think you'll see that we are granting more. I think we've got, we're projecting substantially more cases ready for argument this coming September than we had last year. And, um, and I think the grants are up. Let me switch gears a little bit. Yep. Tell me about your family. Sure. What about them? Well, I, you've mentioned your wife. Yeah, so my you wife. mentioned in passing your kids. What, what, what does your wife do? What, what's, what is she so, like? So my wife uh, is a Columbia Law School graduate. She worked uh, in Trust and Estates at Simpson Thatcher for five years, five and a half years maybe. And then um, we didn't have kids at that point. And um, she sort of got tired of, of that. And um, then we had our first child shortly after. And, um, you know, for a long time, she was saying, you know, when she, when our daughter turns X or, you know, I think I'll go back and get a, a what she was talking about doing was getting a PhD in um, psychology and becoming a psychologist. So she said that for many years. And then we, um, we adopted our second child from Ufa, which is in Bashkortostan, uh, which is one of the stans that remained in, remained in Russia. It's right at the border of Asia and Europe. So the people there are really very interesting looking. If you wanted to start a modeling agency, that would be the place to go because you could find all kinds of different looking people in one place. And um, so she's now 18. She's just f finishing high school. That's our middle daughter. And then we adopted our third daughter from China, uh, from Zhangji province. And she is 12 uh, and just finishing fifth grade. So we've got three girls. We uh, and my wife, uh, we have a girl dog as well. And um, so the three of them are exact, pretty much exactly six and a half years apart each. So 24, 18 and 12. Um, and uh, sometimes it's hard to find something that all three of them really enjoy doing together. And sometimes it's not they're, you know, they're, they're a lot of fun. Oh, my wife. So my wife did go back to school about two years ago and got a master's in library science and is now sort of in the midst of an internship uh, at um, Brooklyn Law School's library. I don't know that she's thinking of working permanently at a, at a law school library, but she might. So with two more than full-time jobs and three daughters, what uh, ah. do you do in your free time? Or is the question what maybe what you would do in your free time if you had free time? Well, in my free time, I do the dishes. I do some laundry. I walk the dog and, uh, you know, feed the dog and we have a cat now too, so I do that. I, um, what I would like to do if I have free time, and when I did have free time years ago, I love to read fiction, and um, I'm a bad pianist, but I've always found it very relaxing to just sit and play. Uh, I'm way out of practice now, so you know I would need a long time um, before I would do anything without headphones on. Well, fiction, who, um, who are your favorite authors? So I tend towards classics, George Eliot, Thomas Hardy, uh, some Americans, I guess I would say um, uh, Steinbeck, Toni Morrison, probably Faulkner more than Hemingway, but I like them both. Um, what is the single most important thing that the judges and non-judicial staff should know about Rowan Dudley Wilson? That I care about them. What a wonderful way to end. Judge, thank you so much for your time and, and thank you for your service. Absolutely. Thank you, John.